Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, we hear stories from Faith Perlo and Katie Weaver and Dan Friedel. Later, Faith returns to answer a question from a listener, and we hear a story by Edgar Allan Poe. But first, Chinese social media users have called attention to a change in the ending of the Hollywood cartoon movie. Minions: The Rise of Gru, for release within the country. The change is the most recent example of Chinese censors changing major Hollywood films to make them more acceptable to the government. Users of China's Weibo website posted photos of the movie screen with the changes. The movie. About a robbery has a new ending for the main character, Wild Knuckles. He spends twenty years in jail after being caught by police. The movie then shows Gru, Wild Knuckles' partner, returning to his family, and having his greatest success as the father to his three daughters. In the international version. The film ends with the two characters riding off together, after Wild Knuckles avoids capture by pretending that he is dead. Chinese social media users laughed at the extra minute in the movie. They said it looked like a PowerPoint presentation, commonly used in schools and businesses. Do sir. Is an internet movie critic, with 14.4 million followers on Weibo. He questioned why the changes were needed. In a story published last week, Du Sir said, "It's only us who need special guidance and care, for fear that a cartoon will corrupt us." The distributors of the film. Universal Pictures in the U.S., as well as Huaxia, Film Distribution, and China Film Company, did not answer a request from Reuters for comment. China limits the number of international movies that could be shown in the country. Many Hollywood movies shown in Chinese theaters have scenes that are changed or cut in some way. Some viewers say they have completely different endings to the films shown in the rest of the world. Viewers of the Tencent video site in China saw a different ending to the popular 1999 movie Fight Club. In the United States version, the main character and his partner set bombs off to destroy several tall buildings. In China, Tencent Video showed a written message on the screen, saying police rapidly figured out the whole plan and arrested all criminals, successfully preventing the bomb from exploding. I'm Faith Perlo. Nepal's holiest river, the Bagmati, begins high in the Himalaya mountains. It has been honored religiously since ancient times. Tradition says its waters have the power to purify souls, but the Bagmati itself is polluted. Along its almost six hundred kilometer path through forest, farmland, and towns, the Bagmati starts to darken with pollution. It is black and full of trash by the time it reaches Kathmandu, the capital. 
The water is undrinkable. It is not useful for cleaning. During the dry season, a bad smell rises from the riverbed. Today, the Bagmati is Nepal's most polluted river. The worsening conditions have sharply changed the way Kathmandu's three million people interact with the river. In the capital, the Bagmati's waters travel slowly past several holy places, including the Pashupatina Temple. It was declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 1979. The huge complex honors the Hindu god Shiva and other lesser gods. Hindus gather on the riverside in Kathmandu to worship at shrines and celebrate holidays or festivals. Women enter the river to wash away sins during the Rishi Panchami holiday. Visitors also get in the water during the festival of Chat. Families have long carried the bodies of loved ones who have died to the river to wash their feet and shake drops of water on their faces. Beliefs hold that the river washes away a person's wrongs and sends their soul to heaven. Later, the body is burned along the banks of the river and the ashes are thrown into the water. People still bring the dead to the Bagmati, but few make contact with the water. That is no more now. The water is so dirty and stinks. People are forced to bring bottled water and do the rituals, said 59-year-old Mithu Lama. She has worked with her husband at the Tekutgat cremation grounds since she was 15. People have also traditionally collected river water to use on their homes to purify them. The river is meaningful to Buddhists as well. Many cremate bodies beside the Bagmati. Born and raised next to the river, Lama recalled using its waters for cooking, bathing, washing, and even drinking. Today, that feels like a long-ago dream ended by the dumping of human waste and trash. There have been efforts by both private volunteers and the government to clean up the river. For example, for the last seven years, hundreds of volunteers have gathered in Kathmandu every Saturday to remove trash from the Bagmati. Mala Karel is among that crowd most Saturdays. She is an executive member of the Governmental High-Powered Committee for Integrated Development of the Bagmati Civilization. It was set up to help clean up the river. She volunteers her time to raise awareness among the population about avoiding pollution. Karel said the campaign has succeeded in collecting about 80% of the trash along the side of the river. The volunteers say they find trash, dead animals, and even the bodies of babies. The cleanup effort is difficult, and more needs to be done. As for the human waste, the committee is working on several projects including new canals and pipes alongside the river. Those are to connect to sewer lines to prevent waste from reaching the Bagmati. The group also is considering a waste treatment plant, and it has started building new dams where rainwater can be captured during the monsoon season and released into the river during the dry months. This could help move waste downstream from Kathmandu. Work on the pipe and canal system began around 2013, but no completion date has been announced. 
building on two dams is continuing and reportedly close to completion. Another dam is getting started. But campaigners have high hopes. The hopefulness is not shared by everyone. Some environmentalists do not know if the dams will be of much help. There is too much expectations from these dams. Bagmati is a natural river and not a canal that can be cleaned so easily, said Madhukar Ubadaya, a scientist who studies the river closely. So much damage has already been done to it, Ubadaya said, that it can perhaps be cleaned to some degree, but not restored to its past glory. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will continue to answer a question from Gustavo in Brazil about describing his teacher using the linking verb be and other adjectives. Hello. My name is Gustavo from Brazil. I have been learning English with you for many years. Thank you for all of the stories. I have a question. I want to say my Spanish teacher, meaning my teacher from Spain. Then I realized that it could also mean my teacher that teaches Spanish language classes. So, which is it? Does it mean both? Thank you very much for reading my message. Gustavo. Thanks once again, Gustavo, for the question. Last week, we looked at two ways to describe your teacher. The first way was with proper adjectives. We use the proper adjective of a language, like Spanish, to describe teachers or students of a language. The second way we can describe your teacher is to talk about where they are from, using the preposition from. This can be useful if you want to be exact about where they were born or are from. So if your teacher does not teach Spanish, then using from is a better choice. You can say, my teacher is from Spain. We also have two other ways we can describe your teacher in a bit more detail. We can also use the linking verb be. For example, my teacher is Spanish. Here, we use the linking verb be and the proper adjective of Spanish after the verb. This means that the teacher is of Spanish heritage or culture. But be careful. This does not always mean that the teacher is from Spain. They could have been born somewhere else, but have Spanish parents. Heritage and culture are not always the same as a person's nationality or where they were born. In the U.S., we commonly use this kind of expression when we talk about where our families or ancestors come from, since many Americans consider their heritage to be from other parts of the world. For example, my friend Pedro is Puerto Rican. Lena's family is Polish, but she is American. We can use an additional adjective to describe what kind of teacher you have if they do not teach a language. We can then combine this with the linking verb be and say where they are from. For example, my economics teacher is from India. Their French teacher is from Canada. Remember, it is sometimes small details that ensure your meaning is understood and mistakes are avoided. Please let us know if these new explanations 
and examples this week have helped you, Gustavo. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews dot com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlo. Today we present the short story, "The Telltale Heart," by Edgar Allan Poe. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. True, nervous, very, very nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed them. Above all, it was. The sense of hearing. I heard all things in the heaven, and in the earth. I heard many things in the underworld. How then am I mad? Observe how healthily, how calmly, I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a bird, a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell on me, my blood ran cold, and so. Very slowly, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and free myself of the eye, forever. Now this is the point. You think that I am mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely and carefully I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him, and every night, late at night, I turned the lock of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening big enough for my head, I put in a dark lantern. All closed, that no light shone out, and then I stuck in my head. I moved it slowly, very slowly, so that I might not interfere with the old man's sleep. And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern just so much. That a single thin ray of light fell upon the vulture eye, and this I did for seven long nights. But I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who was a problem for me, but his evil eye. On the eighth night. I was more than usually careful in opening the door. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my finger slid on a piece of metal and made a noise. The old man sat up in bed, crying out, "Who's there?" I kept still and said nothing. I did not move a muscle for a whole hour. During that time, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done, night after night. Then I heard a noise, and I knew it was the sound of human terror. It was the low sound that arises from the bottom of the soul. I know the sound well. Many a night, late at night, when all the world slept, it has welled up from deep within my own chest. I say I knew it well. 
I knew what the old man felt, and I felt sorry for him, although I laughed to myself. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been, ever since, growing upon him. When I had waited a long time, without hearing him lie down, I decided to open a little, a very, very little crack in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how carefully, carefully. Finally, a single ray of light shot from out and fell full upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew angry as I looked at it. I saw it clearly, all a dull blue with a horrible veil over it that chilled my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the light exactly upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but a kind of oversensitivity? Now there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when inside a piece of cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my anger, but even yet I kept still. I hardly breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I attempted to keep the ray of light upon the eye, but the beating of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every second. The old man's terror must have been extreme. The beating grew louder, I say, louder every moment. And now, at the dead hour of the night, in the horrible silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I stood still, but the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst, and now a new fear seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud shout, I threw open the lantern and burst into the room. He cried once, once only. Without delay, I forced him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled to find the action so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a quiet sound. This, however, did not concern me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it stopped. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the body. I placed my hand over his heart and held it there many minutes. There was no movement. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise steps I took for hiding the body. I worked quickly, but in silence. First of all, I took apart the body. I cut off the head and the arms, and the legs. I then took up three pieces of wood from the flooring and placed his body parts under the room. I then replaced the wooden board so well that no human eye, not even his, could have seen anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no mark of any kind, no blood whatever, I had been too smart for that. A tub had caught all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock in the morning. As a clock sounded the hour, there came a noise at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men, who said they were officers of the police. 
A cry had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of a crime had been aroused. Information had been given at the police office, and the officers had been sent to search the building. I smiled. For what had I to fear? The cry, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I said, was not in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I told them to search, search well. I led them at length to his room. I brought the chairs there and told them to rest. I placed my own seat upon the very place under which lay the body of the victim. The officers were satisfied. I was completely at ease. They sat, and while I answered happily, they talked of common things. But after a while I felt myself getting weak and wished them gone. My head hurt and I had ringing in my ears, but still they sat and talked. The ringing became more severe. I talked more freely to do away with the feeling, but it continued until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. I talked more, and with a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound like a watch makes when inside a piece of cotton. I had trouble breathing, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more loudly, but the noise increased. I stood up and argued about silly things in a high voice and with violent hand movements, but the noise kept increasing. Why would they not be gone? I walked across the floor with heavy steps, as if excited to anger by the observations of the men. But the noise increased. What could I do? I swung my chair and moved it upon the floor. But the noise continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men talked pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? No, no, they heard. They suspected. They knew they were making a joke of my horror. This, I thought, and this, I think. But anything was better than this pain. I could bear those smiles no longer. I felt I must scream or die. And now, again, louder, louder, louder. Villains, I cried, pretend no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the floorboards. Here, here, it is the beating of his hideous heart.